Thank you very much, Sheffield. Um, I'm very pleased to be here in Atlanta at the Atlanta History Center. I've uh, been coming to Atlanta for decades, and I still have very strong connections with the city. My wife went to college here. One of my brothers went to law school here, and he still lives in the city and practices law here. My oldest son also went to law school here, but he does not live in the city. My youngest son does, however, with his family. He lives here. Moreover, my wife has an aunt and cousins who live in the city. So I still very strong connections to Atlanta. Now, tonight, I'm going to discuss Abraham Lincoln's role in the Crisis of the Union, 1860 to 1861. More specifically, I'm going to talk about why Abraham Lincoln rejected any meaningful compromise. Following his election as president in November of 1860, the country was gripped by a sectional crisis. Because many Southerners feared Lincoln and his Republican Party, the Republican Party was a Northern Party, and proudly so. It did not have a significant Southern connection. Lincoln was elected without a single electoral vote from any of the 15 slave states, and in only four of the four border states, Missouri, Kentucky, Maryland, and Delaware, did he get any popular votes, and they are merely a handful. For the first time in the nation's history, a party without any notable Southern component would be taking over the executive branch of the national government. But there was more. The Republican Party was, as I said, proudly a Northern Party. During its brief existence, it was founded in the mid-1850s, its rhetoric had assaulted the South and the South's major social institution, racial slavery. And their determination, that is the Republicans' determination, to weld the North into a unit that could win a national election without any Southern support, Republicans repeatedly condemned the South as unprogressive, undemocratic, even un-American. With this party on the threshold of the presidency, Southern sectional radicals known as fire eaters, those people who preach the gospel of disunion, they took to the public platforms and to the newspaper columns to proclaim that the crisis of the South was at hand. The South had to act immediately to protect itself from the hatred of evil Republicans. Cries of secession fill the Southern air. Now this was not the first time sectional crisis had gripped the country, however. There had been several sharp sectional disputes prior to 1860. Each of these, each of the major ones had been settled uh, by compromise. Here I will point specifically to the four critical ones. First, the Constitutional Convention of 1787 in Philadelphia, the Missouri Crisis of 1820, which had to do with the admission of Missouri as a slave state and the future of slavery in the Louisiana Purchase, which of course, as you know, was much more than the state of Louisiana. It covered almost all the territory from the Mississippi River to the Rocky Mountains, save for Texas. It was settled by the Missouri Compromise. Then in 1832 and 33, the nullification controversy between the state of South Carolina and the federal government was also settled by compromise. And finally, the late 1840s, the battle over the future of slavery in the territory won from Mexico, known as the Mexican Cession, following the Mexican War, was settled by the Compromise of 1850. Thus, you look at these four examples, precedent and tradition, precedent and tradition in place for another such settlement to take place in 1860-61. The chief issue between the Republicans and the South involved slavery, but not slavery in the 15 states where it existed. Almost all Americans in 1860, Republicans included, believed that the Constitution protected slavery in the states where it existed. Rather, the critical question was slavery in the national territories, in the territories owned by the nation that had not yet become states. Geographically, these territories comprised what we think of today as the Great Plains, to 
of the Rocky Mountains and then west of the Rocky Mountains to, to California. Didn't include California because California, as you know, was already a state. The question was so critical because it had to do with the future of slavery and the future of Southern power in the nation. Now, Southerners demanded what they saw as their constitutional rights as American citizens to take their property, including slave property, into territories owned by the entire nation. In 1857, in the famous or infamous Dred Scott decision, the United States Supreme Court affirmed this Southern constitutional view. Republicans, in contrast, said never, no matter the Supreme Court. Republicans would allow no more slaves in any territory. Abraham Lincoln was elected in November of 1860. A month later, the United States Congress came into session. Members of Congress put forth various compromise proposals. A critical portion of all in some way dealt with the division of the territories. Most often there was a proposal to extend some kind of dividing line westward beyond the Louisiana Purchase all the way to the border of California. Now, after this rather lengthy preface, I'm going to get to my main topic, why Lincoln rejected all meaningful compromise, which meant the territories. But there must be one thing more. I'm going to talk about three different men tonight one of you, one of them, all of you know, know his name, Abraham Lincoln and who he was and what he did. The other two are not so well known, though probably a number of you are familiar with Henry Clay, the great Kentucky statesman. Or probably fewer, however, with William Henry Seward, who in 1860 was the senior senator from New York State and prior to Lincoln's nomination for the presidency was by far the most notable and well-known Republican in the country. Now finally, here I am. I'm ready to start. <laughs> Henry Clay. Why am I going to start with Henry Clay, who had been dead for eight years in 1860? During the first half of the 19th century, Henry Clay was a major figure in American politics. He was known as the great compromiser or the great pacificator. For on three occasions, in 1820, in 1832, 1833, and in 1850, Clay had a major role in shaping sectional compromise. Well, still, that doesn't bring Clay down to 1860 to us. Clay comes down to us because Abraham Lincoln looked to Clay as his political mentor. Clay was his political hero. He called Clay my beau ideal of a statesman. Lincoln's best known remarks on Clay uh, came in a eulogy he delivered only a week after Clay's death. In these remarks, Lincoln praised the Kentucky statesman for his leading and most conspicuous part in devising sectional compromise. At the same time, Lincoln underscored that as a politician or statesman, no one was so habitually careful as Clay to avoid all sectional ground. Whatever he did, he did for the country. Showering adulation on Clay for his willingness and ability to work with political opponents as well as with political allies, Lincoln highlighted his main point, that Clay engaged his whole energies on behalf of the Union. As late as February 1861, in the middle of the crisis of the Union, Lincoln professed, during my whole political life, I have loved and revered Clay as a teacher and leader. In his acclamation, Lincoln also noted Clay's opposition to slavery. For Lincoln, that anti-slavery stance was vital because as a man who was opposed to slavery, Lincoln could never embrace as his hero any man who was pro-slavery. Several times in, in addresses, Lincoln made clear, took care to point to Clay's 